You're listening to the Naptime Empires podcast with my mom, Nikki Ellidge Brown. Mom, your show's on. Thanks, bud. I got it from here. Welcome to the Naptime Empires podcast, refreshingly honest conversations on the realities of parenthood and entrepreneurship. I'm your host, Nikki Ellidge Brown. Let's get started. Rachel Cook is a green smoothie enthusiast, restorative yoga advocate, and award-winning business strategist who believes entrepreneurs can grow their dream businesses while living their dream lives right now. After experiencing debilitating anxiety and burnout in her former life in the traditional corporate world, Rachel walked away from a lucrative consulting career and onto a yoga mat. Months later, she married her passion for yoga and business acumen by launching The Yogipreneur, a boutique consultancy teaching the yoga of business and mindful marketing. Since launching The Yogipreneur in 2008 and rachelcook.com in 2014, she's built two multiple six-figure businesses inspiring over 20 thousand entrepreneurs around the world to create profitable, sustainable businesses they can be proud of, all while navigating the beautiful chaos of raising three kids, two kittens, and one cocker spaniel with her husband, Jameson. Rachel's one of the few biz buddies I've actually met twice in real life so far. I mean, there are seriously few biz buddies who have actually met more than one time in real life. We first met online. I'm pretty sure it was through David Seitman Garland's Create Awesome Online Courses group. Then we met in real life in Dallas, When I was eight weeks pregnant, Deke was blueberry status, and I was speaking at Natalie Lussier's Off the Charts live event. Fun fact, actually, Rachel knew I was pregnant before Jeremy did, because he was under the sea till I was nine weeks long, and I just had to tell a few people while we were there. And I'll never forget sitting in a restaurant in the hotel where we were staying where the event was because we had this conversation. I was just asking about her story and she shared about, she was like, yeah, I'm pretty high maintenance, which as she shares in this episode is really just about owning what you need and actually asking for it. And she wasn't always able to do that. So we talk about that more in this episode. When I heard about her support and how she allows herself to receive support in life and in business, I felt totally inspired. I know that you will too. Specifically in this conversation, we cover how she explains what she does to the carpool crew, the moms and parents that you meet in real life who don't really understand what online business is all about just yet, how she manages to work with twins and a husband at home, now they're older actually, and her little one, the value of getting really clear about what's most important, Tips for moms of multiples, dealing with postpartum depression and lack of sleep in the early months. How she let herself start back slowly with just 10 hours a month on retainer, figuring out the mom thing. How she approached her second maternity leave, integrating the lessons she learned from her first. The value of building a solid foundation with a great one-on-one service and then scaling from there. The importance of literally talking with people. The value in choosing the right partner. How she shifted from super controlling to asking for and receiving support. And what she and her husband did to prep for the transition to 100% entrepreneurship. Lots of nuggets in here. Enjoy. All right, Rachel. Let's jam for real this time. (laughs) That's a charm. Last time time we tried doing this, I had a weird random internet outage that had never happened before. And so we tried like three different times, but this time is the, this is the day it's meant to be. Yes. So thanks for repeat. Maybe you're my first repeat (laughs) guest. Okay. I would love to start off just by having you take a few minutes and just tell me about the dynamic over there in the Cook household, the little ones. I know that Jameson, your husband now works with you, but just kind of like paint the picture of what business and babies look like over there. What business and babies look like over here is thankfully we're all out of diapers, (laughs) but essentially I've been a mom. Most of the time I've been running this business. I started the business in 2008 And about six months after I started my business, I found out I was pregnant, which was exciting. And then I found out I was pregnant with twins, which was terrifying. (laughs) And from there, it was a dramatic shift. So my twins are now six and a half. They're in first grade. They are just so much fun. And I've been really I think both like blessed that I've been able to stay home with them, but it's also been very intentional Mm -hmm. that I designed business 
to stay home with them because prior to them being born, I was in the consulting world where I was literally like in my car, driving up and down the East Coast, meeting with people on site, like actually going into businesses and, you know, sitting there in their offices or in their yoga studios or their health centers or whatever it was. So when I got pregnant with my twins, it was a big shift for me to take my business in a new direction. And that's luckily right when all the online stuff started bubbling up, technology became a lot more accessible and a lot less expensive. Mm -hmm. So I was able to shift my business online, which was awesome. It meant I could start consulting people via Skype, which I started doing in 2010. And then I launched my first online program which is now called Sweet Spot Strategy in 2011, which was awesome. Then I got pregnant again. So imagine having three-year-old twins and then deciding to have another baby. (laughs) So we have Mitchell now, who's three and a half, who's amazing and so much fun. He's home with us. And about a year after Mitchell was born, my husband looked at me and was like, hey, I think I'm ready to stay home with you guys. So he left his job as an English teacher to come be my full-time behind the scenes, stay at home dad slash editor of books and podcasts and blog posts and everything. It's really great to have an English teacher help you when you're a content based business. <laughs> so, yeah. Bonus. Yeah. And so that's the dynamic now is we have, you know, Juliana and Alexander, my twins are in first grade, which has been really exciting. It's been a big shift over the last year as they've been going to school. Then we have the little guy who's at home with us. And I'm really loving kind of having those extra days, having my Wednesday mornings where I spend Wednesday mornings just with him. So he gets that little extra one-on-one time and then being able to work from home with my hubby. It's kind of like the dream. I think for a lot of people being able to have that kind of setup. And whenever I tell people, you know, you do like the preschool drop off or you're meeting your kids, friends, parents at back to school night. And it's always, so what do you do? And then I have to explain what we do. And everybody's like, huh? that is so cool that you're yeah. able to do that. That's, I would love to be able to do that, especially when they hear that Jameson's home with me. Right. Yes. Okay. Well, there's so many questions, follow selfish follow-up <laughs> questions that I have about that. So when you talk about it's, you know, like a party over there in that house. How do you get stuff done? And I remember when we met in Dallas, Deacon was just a blueberry and Jeremy didn't even know that he existed yet. Cause this was like super early in my pregnancy and Jeremy had just deployed. And so he was out on mission. So you, you knew <laughs> before Jeremy even did, which is really <laughs> funny. but we were talking. And one of the things that we were talking about in Dallas, we were at Natalie Lucy is off the charts event. And you were like, I'm really high maintenance and I'm totally okay with that. And I was like, I want to be like Rachel when I grow up because that sounds delightful. So tell me more about how you've made it work, especially when the twins were home too. Like how, how did you make that happen to be able to have, you know, good time with them and also be able to be building your business? So I would say the first thing that was part of this was being really clear about what's most important to me. And I think this is really important, especially for mom entrepreneurs, because we're in this time in this space online where there are so many awesome success stories, but it can also shift the focus from what is actually your priority. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that your family is actually everybody's priority. Maybe it's not, maybe it's something else, maybe whatever. But my point is choose your priority. (laughs) Don't let someone else choose it for you. Like be intentional about what your priority is. And for me, when my twins were born, I was very clear. My priority was my twins. When they were born, I actually struggled a lot that first year because I struggled with postpartum depression. And let's face it, I had twins, (laughs) I had newborn twins. I mean, it's exhausting and tiring. Probably the first six months, I don't think I slept at all. So I set myself up for success because I knew it was going to be hard. And I also knew I didn't really know what to expect. So that first year, I didn't work more than maybe 10 hours a month. I had a couple of retainer clients and I was like, this is all I can handle right now. I'm not going to add more on my plate. This is not the time in my life to try to be growing massively my business. And I'll have to say, I'm really thankful that at that stage that Jameson had a full-time teaching job. And that's Mm -hmm. not a lot of money. I mean, teachers, let's face it, in this country, they make nothing. Mm -hmm. But we were living really inexpensively. And it was more important to me to figure out the mom thing and to have a couple of clients that didn't take much time or energy to, you know, pull my share of what we needed as a family. 
And then once, you know, we stopped breastfeeding and everything else, it got easier. And I was able to shift my attention to growing my business. So that's a big thing to me. Like be clear on what your priority is and what makes sense for you and your family. I knew that I needed that year to transition, especially once I got hit with the postpartum depression. I was like, okay, Rach, not the time to go full at it with your ambition. You need to take care of yourself. And this is like a constant conversation I have with myself is taking care of myself. Yeah. Um, that's such a great point about getting swept up in what other people are doing and automatically assuming that's what you need to be doing. And really just not even just taking that quick pause to be like, wait a second, that actually doesn't feel best to me right now to just be throwing everything at this one particular goal or this one particular area of life in this season of life. So that's actually just a really great point, especially yeah. when you're pregnant and you're thinking and you're preparing for baby to get here. And this was totally me this time last year in late 2015, third trimester, I was like super optimistic about everything. I was just going to be able to pull out of the hat in 2016. And the reality of that has not at all been the case. And I'm like, if I would have adjusted my expectations to just really think about what would feel good to focus on instead of just trying to focus on all the things that could have really made a, a difference earlier in the year. So thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. And the other thing to remember is there's a difference between being a first time mom and a second time mom mm -hmm. and having a baby business and trying to have babies. <laughs> yes. It's much easier. I can tell you the second pregnancy and I had a hard second pregnancy. I was very, very sick. I was on bed rest for a good portion of my, of my pregnancy with Mitchell because I had hyperemesis, but because I'd already gone through pregnancy, I'd already gone through babies. I understood what to expect. So it was easier in that regard. But also at that point, my business was a little bit more grown up. You know, I had already done some of the things to lay the foundation for what was a very, very different maternity leave. With Mitchell, I had shifted from doing work, like actually going behind the scenes and doing marketing for people, to teaching courses. And that made a maternity leave a lot easier because I could actually just let that run and I didn't have to be there and be on call for that. So it was just a very different approach and a very different look because I was in a different stage in my family and my business was at a different stage. So I think that's really important is to pay attention to what stage your family is in and what stage your business is in. Cause it's going to look different for everybody. And I definitely hear from first time moms who are just flabbergasted at how hard it is <laughs> to, to have babies and have a baby business at the same time. Mm. So make it as simple as you can, please. For your own sanity, make it as simple as you can. Yeah, I was going to say, so what would be your tip for those who it is, it's inevitable because this is the stage of life and they don't want to be going back to whatever the job was before because they do want to be able to stay home. So, you know, based on all the people that you have, well, actually, let's just, let's just talk about sweet spot strategy and what you help people with. Cause that's what I'm curious about. Like out of all the entrepreneurs that you've helped, what are some of those key things in terms of keeping it simple that you encourage people to focus on when they have the, you know, constrained time and resources by choice, but you know, reality. Yeah. And I work with a lot of moms. I work with a lot of women entrepreneurs who are actually at different stages of life, but the whole desire for more freedom and more flexibility in their business so that they can enjoy their life is a major desire for a lot of them. So generally what happens when I work with people inside of sweet spot strategy is we talk about building a foundation first and then building up from there. And what generally happens because most of my people are not B2B. So most of my people are not like designers or copywriters. We're starting to get more of those, but not a ton, but most of them are actually consumer facing They're yoga teachers and health coaches and life coaches and holistic healthcare practitioners. Because I've talked about being a mom so much, I have at least six doulas in my program, a midwife, an OBGYN, like we have a huge birthing community, which is kind of hilarious, but this is what happens when you talk about being a mom. <laughs> and one of the things we talk about is just building a solid foundation with a great one-on-one -on -one service and getting away from one-off sessions because in the, for most of them, that's how most of that world is generally marketed. For example, I recently had a flare up of a back issue I've had for years. And so I go to the massage therapist. Usually they will just offer the one session. I don't ever talk to you about, well, what are you experiencing? Okay, here's what I recommend for you to get out of pain and then start to heal it. We should meet two times a week for the first couple of weeks and then we'll go to weekly and then we'll go to every other week. And it'll take us about two months to get your back to where 
it's no longer flaring up and you're no longer in pain. They don't do that. They're like, okay, cool. You can call in and book a session later. You know what I mean? And that whole mindset of what most service-based entrepreneurs, you know, kind of buy into because they don't know how to package or set up their offerings in a way that's more solution focused. Mm. It sets themselves up for the feast or famine cycle big time because they're always hustling for that next one or two hour session instead of looking at bigger picture and saying, okay, I'm going to work with you for two months or three months or six months or whatever that is. So usually for most people, it's creating a real program. If you are a service-based entrepreneur, it's not just looking at it as trading dollars for hours. It's saying, okay, I have a program to get you from point A to point B. If I'm trying to get you out of pain, it's going to take us this, it's a process we're going to do. And this is how we're going to make it happen. So then you're no longer selling dollars for hours. You're selling a process, you're selling a result. And that changes the game. You don't have to have lots and lots and lots of one-time clients. I have so many clients who their calendars are booked now with maybe 15 regular clients, but they're making eight or 10 or $12,000 a month. Mm. Because those people are signing up for a program. They're signing up for an actual result and they're committed to it. So it makes a huge difference for them. So for most people, it's setting up that foundation of having a solid service And the best thing about that is, and this is what I went through. Once you go through that process with enough people, you're going to start hearing the same things. You're going to start seeing that, okay, this is literally the process I'm taking people through. I could teach them how to do this themselves, or I could teach others how to teach this process. Mm -hmm. And that's how we start to build in more leverage. But trying to skip to that for service-based entrepreneurs is really challenging. Trying to skip to like a leveraged group program or online training program, if you haven't actually gone through the process with enough people one-on-one or in a more intimate setting, it can actually set you up for a lot of frustration. And that's where I see a lot of people getting so upset is because they try to rush into that and they don't really understand what's actually going on for the people that they really want to work with. Mm, yeah. so the foundation, we really get to know our people And then we move forward into adding more layers. For me, I always think about layers, whether it's adding onto your business, adding multiple, you know, streams of revenue by adding one layer and then the next layer and then the next layer, or even like your marketing, you know, you start with one layer of your marketing. And then as you get that layer down, like for some people, the idea of sending out a newsletter every other week, it's overwhelming and they, they just get overwhelmed and stressed out by it. But if you start with that, you get good at it and you can do that pretty easily. Suddenly then it's like, okay, now I can add getting interviewed once a month, Hmm. you know, but once you start doing it and that rhythm, so it's about layers, it's about incrementally upgrading and adding something, not trying to do it all at the same time. And when you allow it to be easier and more kind of growing into these phases, instead of rushing into them then it becomes so much easier and more sustainable for you because you're not constantly like pushing against something that your business just isn't quite ready yet. It would be the equivalent of if my son who just signed up for Boy Scouts this year decided he wanted to go off into the woods for like a survival trip (laughs) and he's six and a half, like he's not ready yet. Right. So you don't want to throw your business into situations where it's just maybe not quite ready to take that step. There are some things you have to do, some foundation you have to lay. And if you give yourself permission to take time with it, then it's not stressful. But if you try to rush it and try to skip over some steps, you're going to find yourself getting really frustrated and overwhelmed and burned out. That's so true. And, you know, looking back, the way that I started off, at least in my first year of business, I was working and I was doing a bunch of one-off sessions because I had no desire to be like, I'm going to help everybody write all the sites and all the things. And I was just kind of exploring. So I ended up working with over 160 people in my first eight months. But honestly, within the first five, it was so clear to me what people wanted and needed help with, which is ultimately how A Course About Copy came to be because I was like, all right, I started off by being like, I can help people with communication, but that's so broad. So I would give them a list of like, these are all the things I could help you with. And time after time, it was like, copy, 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 writing about myself, writing about myself. And so about page bio. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) In the sessions, I was like, all right, everybody feels weird about writing about themselves and they don't know what to say. And that's, you know, part of the problem. It doesn't need to be all about you on your about page. And so that to me, it was, it was just so clear because the sheer amount of people I was working with, it was so obvious to spot the pattern. But I can see where it would be totally frustrating 
if you're like, what is the thing and how can I help? If you're just, if you're not clear on the pattern yet of the solution of what people are getting stuck on and how you can help. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, You have to talk to real people. Bottom line, like you have to get out there and engaged and involved with real people. I think that's one of the reasons that your business took off so fast was because you put yourself out there and had all of those calls in such a condensed time frame. Yeah. And one of the things that I teach, and actually we just went through this with my students, is what I call the five real people interviews. It's actual assignment <laughs> that they have to go out there and interview five people about what they're struggling with and where they're stuck. And the insights they get are mind blowing. And they're just like, whoa, I never thought about it like this. And they realize that they might have been really close. But until they actually had those conversations, they were just kind of missing the mark, just that mm-hmm. tiny, tiny bit that was enough to keep people from sticking. Yeah, that reminds me too of, oh, and I, I'm like, what did I already tell her this? This was when we recorded our faux episode earlier, but I was like, you're one of the few people like online biz buddies that have actually met twice because we met in Dallas. And then again, this year we met in Vegas. And I know that that's one of Todd Herman's 90 day year mm-hmm. event. And that's one of his biggest things is like, talk to people, talk to people. And Melanie and Devin Duncan were talking about how during their first launch of 90 day a year, they were like, what are you doing? Cause they would get the sale. And then he picks up the phone and he's like, I'm calling him. I'm calling him. I'm going to see what was it? What was it that pushed you over the edge? What made you want to join? What are you looking for? And all of that. And I'm like, right. It's so weird how easy it is for you to be like online and then just thinking everything has to happen through the computer, but that real live connection yeah. you know, over zoom or Skype or over the phone can just be so valuable for so many different reasons, but certainly by getting to oh, yeah. what people are struggling with is, is one of them. And I love that you brought that up because even tying it back to moms, you know, when I first started my business, I remember looking online and I was like, I need to find a coach. I need, I need to find somebody who's a few steps ahead of me, who's already taken a consulting and training business online so they can teach me. And as I started searching online for a coach, I just had this clear picture. I wanted to work with a woman who had kids, who had what I wanted, you know, and I couldn't find it. (laughs) I couldn't Mm -hmm. find that person anywhere in 2008. I found all these men who I could tell were just working crazy hours. I mean, the Frank Kearns and the, you know, product launch formula guy, Jeff Walker, like all these big names. I found them, but it was obvious they were way, way ahead of where I was. And they were working crazy hours. And I found some women too. There's a huge coaching world out there. And I kind of (laughs) am like half in the coaching world, half in the online marketing world. But most of them didn't have super young kids. Mm -hmm. And I really struggled with that. So I remember I hired my first coach who at that point didn't have any kids, but she was at least felt like she was just a few steps ahead of me. She was very heavy into lifestyle design and to designing a business around the life that you want. And I remember my first conversation with her, I have these one-year-old twins. I'm still nursing them. I'm, you know, working from home and I'm like, I only want to work 25 hours a week, but I need to get to six figures in the first year taking this business online. Mm -hmm. I think she kind of laughed at me over the phone a little bit like, okay, we'll see how this goes. Mm -hmm. It, It was hard because there were no other moms that I could see who had done that. Yeah. And who had done that in the, time frame that I was looking to do, not just in the year time frame, but like only 20 or 25 hours a week. And now it's so different. Like just look at the difference between 2010 and 2016. There's so many more moms. And I know that if it wasn't for the moms I started meeting, I, there are so many times I would have thrown in the towel Mm -hmm. (laughs) because they have become my real support group. They understand not only what it's like to run an online business like this, but also run it while being a mom and a wife and all the other roles that you have. Right. That's part of, that's exactly part of, I can't even remember when Naptime Empires like came into my brain as the divine download. It might've even been sometime in 2014 for sure, at least a year ago. And that was part of it was like, okay, well, it's just a conversation to have because, and you know, there's all the controversy over terms like mompreneur, mompreneur, so and so preneur, and like maybe primary caregiver preneur <laughs> should be a thing. Because <laughs> some people love the term, some people hate the term, and I yeah. don't really care. I'm like anti word police. I'm like, say whatever you want to say, and people will attach their own meanings to it. But the exactly. truth is, like, there are a lot of entrepreneurs out there who are parents, but then some people don't talk about it 
But for me, I'm like, well, yeah, but those aren't necessarily my people because for me, it is a primary, like, this is a factor. This is a nut I want to crack. You know, this is a, how can I really make this work in a way that I feel good about it? And then on the days when I feel poopy about it, how can I give myself that grace and self-compassion when I fall short of my ideal? You know, how can I be honest about my constraints, but also not just lowering the bar in a completely demotivating way? And so that's basically the whole idea behind Naptime Empires is just refreshingly honest conversations about what it looks like for different people. And I'm glad that you said at the beginning, like it was an intentional thing. It's not like this just, well, you know, this just happened. It was intentional that you designed your business this way when you were six months in and finding out that you were pregnant with twins, like you got real clear, real quick on how you wanted this to look and started taking action to make that happen. So yeah, it's fascinating to hear. I mean, because the variety of conversations I've had about just so far on this podcast, which at the time we're recording this still just lives in my Dropbox right now because I haven't watched it. <laughs> but it's, I love the wide variety of topics because we have, we've talked about all the things because that's life, right? I mean, it's, it's yeah. so easy to just segment and be like, all right, now I'm in business mode. Now I'm in mom mode, but that's kind of the ultimate goal. Yeah. Like, well, and that's a lot of it for me has been getting clear about those priorities. And like you said, yes, I would say I'm high maintenance and that means asking for support Mm -hmm. when I need it. And I was surprised. I created this thing called the fired up and focus challenge in 2014. And it kind of exploded on me. Like we've had nearly 20,000 people go through it now, which is mind boggling to me. Like it it amazes me every time we run it live. Of course, when you run something live enough times, you see the same questions coming up and the same questions I see coming up, especially from women entrepreneurs who have small children at home. Rachel, how do you handle keeping up your house and running your business? How do you handle like all the chores that go along with being a mom? How do you, and it, all the big questions at first are just about like, basically, how do you make time for your business? How do you make your business a priority? Mm -hmm. And I think, One, for a lot of women, it's easy for us to shift into default parent and default home CEO, (laughs) you know? And for me, I never allowed that to happen. I was very intentional with Jameson when we, you know, decided I was going to keep moving forward on the business. It was like, okay, here's where I need help. You need to take over dinner X number of nights a week. I need you to do this stuff. And so I'm very lucky. I think choosing the right partner is very important. If you want to be a successful entrepreneur or just have a happy life, you need to choose somebody who's willing to support you in the way you need to be supported. I wish I could reprogram husbands or run like a husband boot camp, but I just had a good one. (laughs) And he's been willing to step up in areas where, I mean, Nikki, until probably 2012, he had never made anything as a meal beyond maybe like eggs and bacon. Mm-hmm. That's and now, me. <laughs> See, that's me. Jeremy's the cook in our family too. <laughs> I love to cook, but it got to the point where it's like, okay, if the only time I have to work is literally, it was from the time he got home at three o'clock from school until about six o'clock at night. That was a big window I had. So I was yeah. like, you've got to get dinner on the table so that I can work. And he had to learn how to cook. He had to learn how to iron shirts for his own work. I didn't, I was like, no, I can't do this for you. If you want to wear a shirt to school tomorrow, (laughs) you need to iron it. So those are things that I think a lot of women struggle with for whatever reason. We have a lot of cultural programming that some of us are fighting against, but be willing to ask for support. I was willing to ask for support from him. I was willing to have a conversation with him about, you know, I think it's worth it for us to spend a hundred dollars a week on a housekeeper so that I'm not spending all day Saturday cleaning the house Mm -hmm. the way I wanted it to be cleaned. (laughs) And I was like, and I only need one extra client a month to pay for this. And he was like, oh, well, that's easy. So that's a big piece for me is asking for support when you need it and finding a way to partner with your partner around it. Because at the time I wasn't, you know, anybody who's building a business, and I know you've been through this, you spend a lot of time reinvesting everything you're making back into the business and trying to keep it growing and keep it moving forward. But there does come a time where you suddenly start making really good money and then they realize, oh, look at what we've done together. Mm-hmm. And they're a part of your team. And that's now, what you have to keep in mind. I'm curious, were you always good at asking for support 
before the babies came, before the twins came? Or do you think, because I'm wondering if by having twins right off the bat, ultimately people, I mean, ideally people flock and help, you know, new moms with newborns and everything. But when there are twins or multiples at play, usually people are like, okay, she's going to need our support because she's outnumbered right off the bat and that kind of thing. So were you always good at asking for support or did that come when, when they came and you were like, okay, but straight up, I need, I need help here. I need more. Actually, hands. I was terrible at it. And I don't think I even left Jameson alone with the twins until they were probably six months old. I was super controlling and protective and wanting to do all the things and be super mom. Mm. And then I just realized this is not getting us anywhere. I was miserable. He was frustrated. I mean, the babies didn't know any different because they're only six months old. But at that point, like we hadn't even had a date night because I was not wanting to let anybody else take care of them. So it was a process. And that process looked like me getting out of the house, which was the first thing. Jameson just basically looked at me. He was like, you need to get out of the house. Go walk around Target or go to a yoga class. Go do something. Like, get out of here. Yeah. So some of that was him saying, okay, no, it's time for me to step in now and make you take care of yourself. Again, that has been a theme of my life is learning how to take better care of myself. And after that, I just had to have a real come to Jesus moment with him, which was you know what, I actually do need to take better care of myself or else I'm going to turn into crazy Rach who Mm -hmm. hasn't showered in five days and (laughs) is like covered in whatever this is (laughs) he's have. So yeah, it was a lot. I credit Jameson a lot. He knew that it was like, okay, you've done the controlling mom thing. We're all good now. We're we're going to stop. (laughs) Yeah. And since then, it's been a little, I think it gets a little easier as they get older. I remember the first time I left the twins, I cried on the airplane to go to a business retreat for like five days. I cried on the airplane. I cried while I was there. <laughs> I was mm-hmm. so sad and upset. I had a very hard time with that. But it gets easier and you just have to kind of find your your rhythm and your comfort zone with what feels good to you. I know some moms are totally fine, like right off the bat. They're like, yep, I got a babysitter right off the bat. And I was good with putting them in daycare and I left for a week and it was no big deal. And for me, it was really hard. So I, I baby stepped my way into everything, mm-hmm. everything. Absolutely. Like even when I needed childcare help, I was like, you know what? I want to keep them home. So how can I find a babysitter to come help me at home instead of me taking them to a daycare? I just really wasn't ready for that. Mm-hmm. So for the first year we had babysitters coming to the house two days a week. And that's what I felt comfortable with because I could hear them and I was there and I could still nurse them. And then after a little while, I got comfortable with the idea of maybe putting them in a preschool. And yeah, and now they're they're first grade. (laughs) I'm totally the mom who's like sentimental and cries over all this stuff because it happens fast. Uh, Yeah. Oh my gosh. I will. Now's the perfect time for the Gretchen Rubin quote. The days are long, but the years are short. And that is certainly the case, especially when there's more than one. I mean, I can't imagine having more than one at a time because you're like, wait, stop. You're growing up so fast, but you're, wait, wait. And it's like when Deacon came along, I was like, wait, but Bryson's not all of a sudden just going to pause for a second so that I can soak this in. He's going to keep growing up so fast. I'm like, wait, how am I? I really, he just turned five as the time we're recording this, this last week, this is his birthday. And I would just remember right after Deacon was born, for some reason, it hadn't hit me that five follows four. And I make, I'm i like, yeah, I made an A in calculus. But for some reason, the fact that five came after four was really throwing me for a loop when I realized that by the time we went to Disney World, Carson was going to be five. And I cried over it because I was like, wow, how is that going so fast? Especially when there's a littler one and your little one all of a sudden seems big in comparison yeah. to little one. Well, yeah. it's uh, crazy. It's crazy. But that's a big reason for me that I designed this business the way that I did. It's why we've taken some big leaps of faith to live the life we really wanted, even if it meant sacrificing in one area of our life to make sure that we could do things on our terms in another area. And it's, I mean, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I really wouldn't. It's been amazing being able to be home with these kids. I don't know if you know this, Nikki, but when I was little, I was four when my mom was in a really terrible car accident. Oh, I didn't and I was four and my sisters were two years old and eight months old. And my mom was hit by a tractor trailer right after she had dropped us off at preschool and was in a coma for three months. So from the time my mom 
was literally my age. I mean, she was, I think she was, no, she was 33 when it happened. So she was younger than I am now, but she was in a coma for three months and then in the hospital for another two years. And so I don't have any memories of my mom this, at this age. I don't have any memories Mm -hmm. of my mom when I was in kindergarten or preschool or anything because she was in the hospital. I remember going to the hospital. I remember that. I remember going to rehab with her and the rehabilitation hospital and helping her like literally learn how to walk. And I remember brushing her teeth again. Mm. I think because of that, growing up with a mom who's been through that, it really made me know going into being a parent that this is something you don't get back. You don't know if tomorrow is the last day ever. And I really encourage, and this is one of the reasons why I love working with women entrepreneurs is because I think you don't want to leave any life unlived and you don't want to regret spending time with your family or spending time with the people you love. There's just no guarantees that you'll be there tomorrow. Right, man. And it's so, again, bizarrely easy to forget that. You know, I I was listening to Thrive by Ariana Huffington and she talks a lot about like death and thinking to whenever you do eventually die, how do you want to be remembered and how do you want have lived to have lived your life and all of that. And I want to re-listen to it and I'll link to it in the show notes too. Cause it was just, to me, I was like, right, right. No day is guaranteed. This is, you know, we're here just for a certain amount of time and really looking back and thinking like, how do you want to have spent your time? Is it really, Again, easy to fall into the trap of the newsfeed. It's like I get vertigo because I'm just like scrolling, 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 scrolling. And then you don't even realize it. But it's like, is that really what matters? No, it's not. You know, put the phone away. And again, there's balance somewhere in there. So it's not like it's all bad. There's certainly great things about the technology and all of the various things that we're doing, you know, and it's it's chicken or the egg, right? Because by building that business and by taking that time to connect with that client or whatever, then you're enabling yourself to be able to have more time with your family. But we do just have to be really honest about like how we're living each day ends up being how we're living our lives. And then how do we want that to actually look? So yeah, Yeah, being intentional is everything. And I always start by making sure that every week I'm kind of depositing in you just kind of, I kind of think of it as like, here's the Alex account and the Julie account and the Mitchell account and the Jameson account. Am I making sure I'm really investing in these relationships now? Mm-hmm. And that might mean, you know, I take the twins out there at the age now, they're six and a half. So they have activities and that means they get a date night with mom. I take them to their activity. And then I say, okay, what restaurant do you want to go to? I'm going to go to Barnes and Noble tonight. And they get to pick what we want to do. We have that time together one-on-one and they love it. And that time is precious to me. I mean, it's amazing. You don't get that back. And doing the same thing with Mitchell, having my Wednesday mornings with Mitchell or date night with Jameson, like really making sure you're being intentional about where you're spending your time. Because I could very easily just drop them off at dance or Boy Scouts or whatever and just zone out in front of Gilbert Girls reruns on Netflix. (laughs) But at the end of the day, like... Which is good sometimes. Sometimes we need that. That's great, but... It's not as important as making sure I'm doing what matters most every every single day with intention. Right. Okay. So speaking of, you know, your marriage and relationship and date night and all that goodness, I am curious because again, we're about to be facing this transition where Jeremy's in home. And I'm like, oh my gosh, right. I would love it. I would love to be like, okay, I need you to be home. But that I know for sure is why I had less of an issue. Like with, with Bryson, he didn't go into in-home daycare. He was six months old by the time he went into in-home daycare just two days a week. And I had been working part-time from home between the park service job and my University of Phoenix facilitating courses for them. So, but with Deacon, it was like literally just a few weeks in where I was like, okay, I'm the only grown up here and I need to know that I have another set of hands at some point. So for me, it was like so much easier the second time around to be like, yep, I need help because mentally it was just too taxing to think yeah. no end in this loop, you know, and Deacon <laughs> was and has been the most amazing little angel child. Like he's so chill and usually very happy, like just easygoing, whatever. But still I was like, no, I need to know that there's another grown up coming at some point, even if it's just so I can like 
take a nap or just feel like I could, if I wanted to, to go do something. I don't even know. I haven't even done it. Walk around Target. That's (laughs) that's like my mommy break. It's like, Hey, I need to go walk around Target and check out the home section. (laughs) There's just something that you feel so much relief when you know, like you're not the only one and you can't replace that feeling when it's your actual when it's the other parent home, because there's always a level and a layer of like being on high alert, even when it's a super trusted babysitter that you love, you either feel like a little like, Oh, is is my kid being okay? Like, are they behaving? Is, is something going on? But when it's the other parent, you can just feel like, ah, okay, it doesn't matter. He's got this under control. Like I actually went and met a buddy who was in town from Australia for dinner the other night. And I was like, yeah, Woo! I'm wearing perfume because Deacon's not going to sneeze if I wear it. And Jeremy's got this. And so there are so many great things, but I also wonder like, how was the transition? And it was his idea. Was it his idea? He it was, was kind like, of a I'm mutual ready. idea. Yeah. Cause I think Jameson's the kind of guy who is so good with the flow. Like we're very opposites in that way. I can mm-hmm. be super like type a controlling, planning it to death. And he's like, yeah, whatever, babe, no worries. Yeah. And I think opposites attract, definitely. But about a year before he decided to leave, we started talking about it seriously because we knew we would have to have a game plan. One, even though I was making a whole lot more money than he was making, it felt like <laughs> it felt like it was a big step, you know, yeah. like cutting that final, like dependable paycheck, even yes. if it was only like $2,500 a month. Yes. It was, it felt like a big step just emotionally, psychologically, whatever. So of course, me being me, we went into super planning mode and we were like, okay, what do we want to make sure that we have so that we feel on that end, like financially, really, really stable mm-hmm. and like this could work. So we spent a lot of time like power saving and we decided we were going to buy a house while he was still employed as a teacher mm-hmm. because Buying a house as an entrepreneur is terrible because even though I'm on paper, you know, looking at my taxes, they were like, okay, we can see you make all this, but you're an entrepreneur. So obviously this doesn't matter at all, right? which is just really stressful. So all, you know, we took a lot of time with it to plan it out, to think about it because we had three kids, you know, this was time to just do this without thinking. But aside from that, you know, the nice thing is because he was a teacher, he had summers off. So we were already kind of used to that Mm -hmm. and being home for three months out of the year, which made maybe the transition easier because he left and turned in his resignation this summer before the next school year. So we had a good solid month into it, like trying to figure out how it was going to go. For us, we had to renegotiate our job titles, basically. And by that, I mean, you know, again, the dynamic shifted. He was home now. So I expected him to take on more of the home stuff. Because even though he was great at a lot of things, I was still doing the bulk of the laundry and the cooking and the shopping. Oh my God, the shopping. (laughs) Because you know, when you have kids, it's like every other week they've grown out of something. Yeah. So I was like, okay, I I will take on clothes shopping because I know you hate that. Can you plan the meals? And so we kind of had to start figuring that logistical stuff out again, because it was like, I need to be moving the business forward in order to offset you leaving teaching and making sure that, you know, we've replaced that income even more. So we renegotiated kind of our home job titles. And then it was a process to let him figure out what he wanted to do in my business. Jameson doesn't have any business background. He has a composition minor, music composition, and a creative writing and English degree. So he's very, very creative but not very businessy. So he wasn't sure how he was going to fit in. And I remember the first day he was really like sitting in on all my calls with my team and kind of really beside me for for the first few days he was home with me. And he's like, Oh my God, Rach, I didn't even know how much you were doing in order to keep (laughs) business growing. He's like, I had no idea all the stuff that goes into this. And it's so funny because you guys, this is like six years into my business. (laughs) <laughs> he was like, Hey, I didn't even realize. Right. No, that's the same. Well, yeah. Jeremy's straight up been under the sea for most of it. So I can't blame him, but it's so funny. I'm like, do you know, do you know what I'm doing over here? Yeah, I have no idea, but it was interesting to see. He had a whole new appreciation for what, you know, what I've been able to do. And I think was just really excited to jump in. So for him, it, it was a little bit of an experience. I mean, I wanted him to work on the business a little bit with me. He wanted to work on the business a little bit with me, but we had to figure out what that was going to look like. Like, what did he actually want to do? So we played a few things and gave him a few projects and figured out what he wanted to spend his time on. And we kind of landed on, well, he likes to 
edit the podcast and he likes to edit the videos for my courses and he likes to do kind of the technical things and the Englishy things. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> and he likes doing that. And you know what, honestly, it's been great because I always know we've all had those moments where it's like you have on your deadline is for tomorrow and you still have to edit the recording and I can just be like, babe, grab your laptop. Here you go. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Cause I'm like, Oh man, if I'm procrastinating, I can't outsource it because I can't be like, Hey, it's 11 PM. But yeah, if you have your in-house editor, then hey. I can wake him up. <laughs> I'm the hey, babe, Get out of bed with the three-year-old. I know you fell asleep while putting him to bed, but it's time for you to get up and edit. <laughs> oh yes. That is a signature move around here too, where I'm always like going upstairs to Jeremy. I'm like, uh-uh. Not done with this day yet. I know you just wanted to sneak in bedtime already, but no. You're yeah, gonna, crawl out of the top of that. <laughs> That's so funny. Okay, so as we wrap up, are there any, I mean, obviously we could talk about all kinds of other things and rabbit holes, and I, I'm very intrigued in your <laughs> buying a house experience because that's definitely going to be the case for us too. It's like buying the house while we're still in. But are there any main key takeaways, lessons, ahas, insights that we haven't talked about that you would love to leave with our buddy listening right now, naptime empire building phase of life. Yeah, I would say, you know, one, just honor the phase of life and the phase of business you're in. If you can just really embrace it, it will make everything so much easier. Just like you don't want to miss out on your babies growing up. You don't want to miss out on your business, really getting that solid foundation in place. So really enjoy it. Embrace it. It's only going to happen once and things are going to evolve faster than you, you can imagine. Simplify, simplify whatever you can simplify everything in your life, in your business. I'm like a minimalist in so many things. I don't like to complicate anything. I like my wardrobe simple. I like our meal planning simple. I like my business marketing plan to be simple. I like everything to be very simple and straightforward. And you know what? It makes my life a lot easier because I can get people on board and get a team to help me out. So simplify as much as you can. And I think the final one is don't be afraid to ask for support. I jokingly say I'm high maintenance, but I'm just asking for help. I'm asking to get my needs as a human, as a wife, as a mom met. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think there's a lot of shame and guilt that we as a society have put on us. Like there's all this pressure to be the perfect wife who has a perfect house and everything is like beautifully decorated. It looks like you stepped into Pinterest and you know, then you have the perfect body and you're running marathons and you know, it's just all this perfection crap is gotta go. Like just let it go. We don't need to be perfect. We can just be human and it's okay. So just be human, do what matters most and let go of everything else. I love that. Well, thank you for modeling. I mean, like I said, that high maintenance thing. And again, we're saying it jokingly, but really that's the thing because we can't have all these expectations to be able to do all the things and expect to do all the things alone. And I do think that is still a huge block and misconception that so many people have just from this Naptime Empires type form survey of so many people like, how do you do all this and this and this and this? And I'm like, all right, well, you either need to lower the freaking bar or you need to get some help because not all of those things are going to happen with just yes. a human being. So thank you for modeling that and sharing your evolution of not being able to ask for help and then being like, sweet, this support thing is amazing. And you're I giving mean, other people. It's awesome. I highly recommend it. Exactly. <laughs> Right. And just like your clients and customers are hiring you for help. I mean, it's like, it's, it's a virtuous cycle because the people who are helping and supporting that's part of their blessing or that's part of them showing up and living their purpose in the world. So it's like, you're not putting someone out, you know, by giving them the opportunity to help. That's something that could really mean a lot to them too. Absolutely. That's lovely. Okay. So where can we find you online? And I'll, I'll link all this up in the show notes, but just so you can tell us through our sure. earbuds. The best place to find us online, find me online is at rachelcook.com. It's R-A-C-H-E-A-L-C-O-O-K.com. And also I'm always hanging out over on Facebook and Instagram. So if you want to find me on social, facebook.com slash Rachel Cook or instagram.com slash Rachel Cook, I'm there in both places pretty much all the time. <laughs> all right. Sweet spot strategy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you <laughs> buddy Rachel Cook, for sharing all of this. Thank you for again, being super patient and flexible as we reschedule to make it happen. I loved this conversation and I love watching you work your magic on your side of the world. Back at you, mama. It's been great. 
This show may be over, but the conversation is just beginning. Head on over to naptimeempires.com slash Facebook so you can join my free... Wait, did I say free? I meant priceless, rapidly growing community of Naptime Empire Builders for deeper discussions, behind the scenes scoop, and of course, updates whenever I've got new stuff coming up for you. NaptimeEmpires.com slash Facebook. See you there. See you next time. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Good job, buddy.